Hi, everybody, and welcome to our module on ethical principles. When we use the term ethics, we are referring to a set of moral principles that can be used to guide either an individual or a group's behavior. So if you are a physician, how are you going to know if you are behaving in an ethically responsible manner? Well, the way this is usually done is through what's known as principalism, and this is the practice of using principles to guide medical ethics. And in the United States, this is the most common framework for ethical reasoning. And principalism says that there are four core principles that you should follow to ensure that you are acting in an ethically responsible manner. And those four principles are autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And in the next few slides, we'll go through each of these principles one at a time. Of those four principles, autonomy is the most important ethical principle in the United States. And in terms of health care, autonomy refers to the absolute right of all competent adult patients to make decisions about their own health care. In other words, every patient in the United States has autonomy over their own body and can make their own decisions about what to do with their body. And importantly, autonomy includes the right of patients to accept or not accept medical care. And providers must respect these decisions and they have to honor the patient's preferences. So even if we disagree with the decision that a patient makes, because the principle of autonomy is so important in the United States, we must honor their decisions. And the way this is often tested in the USMLE exam is you are presented with a scenario where a patient declines medical care and they ask you what is the most appropriate response. Now, it's always okay to ask why the patient is declining because you want to make sure that the patient has all the necessary information to make an appropriate choice. However, what you want to do is avoid any statements that are judging or threatening or scolding because all of these disrespect the autonomy of that patient to decline medical care. So, for example, you don't want to pick an answer choice that says something like, you may die if you make this choice or this choice is a mistake or you should not do this. All of these answers suggest that you are not respecting the patient's autonomy to decline medical care. The next core principle is beneficence, and this refers to the fact that providers must act in the best interests of their patients. And this is fairly obvious, you don't want to harm your patients, but what you need to appreciate about the core principle of beneficence is that it is usually superseded by autonomy. Remember what I told you before, autonomy is the most important principle in the United States. So what this means is that patients may choose to act against their best interests. For example, a patient may decline life-saving medical care, and the patient is allowed to do that because we respect their autonomy, even though the principle of beneficence says we should not allow the patient to decline that life-saving medical care. So in other words, autonomy supersedes the principle of beneficence. Third ethical principle is non-maleficence. This is the principle that says that physicians should do no harm to patients. And importantly, this is always balanced against beneficence. In other words, we always balance risks versus the benefits of the things we do in medicine. And we do sometimes do harmful actions to patients. For example, surgery can be harmful, but we are able to do this despite the principle of non-maleficence because surgery is beneficial. So in that instance, we are doing harm to a patient, but we're doing it for a good reason, and therefore it is ethically acceptable. And the final core principle is justice. This refers to treating patients fairly and equally. It also refers to using healthcare resources equitably. And the clinical scenario where this often comes up is in triage. So in the emergency room, we often see the sickest patients first, and we see less sick patients last. This is called triage. And this is ethically acceptable under the principle of justice because we are treating patients fairly and equally by seeing the sickest ones first. It's a form of what's known as distributive justice, and it allows care to be delivered fairly to all, even though we aren't able to see all patients the second they come to the emergency room. For the remainder of this module, I'm going to go through some specific ethical scenarios that you are often faced with on the USMLE exam, and we'll start with gifts from companies. So many times physicians are offered gifts from drug or device companies or manufacturers, and these gifts can be ethically problematic because they can potentially influence physician behavior. Generally, gifts from companies are considered acceptable only if two criterion are met. First is that the gift is educational, and second is that it's of low value. So for example, an educational dinner where a drug company pays for your dinner, but at the dinner you learn about taking care of patients, this is usually okay. The same is true if a drug company offers you a textbook. If you're going to use that textbook to take care of patients, it's generally considered okay. The value should be low, however, which usually means less than $100. 
larger gifts that are not educational are not acceptable. So for example, drug companies cannot give you cash or tickets to ball games or vacations. These things are all considered not acceptable because they are not educational and they are not of low value. Honoraria are fees that are paid to physicians by industry. For example, many drug or device companies will pay a physician to promote research about a new product that the company is selling. For example, many drug companies pay doctors to speak to other doctors and talk about how to use their products. This is acceptable, but it must be disclosed to the audience. So for example, if a doctor like myself were asked to give a talk about a new heart failure drug, at the beginning of that talk, I would have to disclose that I was being paid by a drug company to give that talk. Also, the fee has to be fair and reasonable. Drug companies cannot pay physicians tens of thousands of dollars for a 30-minute talk. And also the fee cannot be in exchange for the doctor using the product. So I can't say I promise to prescribe your product if you pay me to give this talk. Gifts from patients to physicians are a little bit different. There are no definite rules, but in general, small gifts are usually considered acceptable. So for example, some of my patients bring cookies at Christmas time, and this is generally considered to be okay. On the other hand, large excessive gifts are usually considered not okay because they may be viewed as given in exchange for special treatment. So for example, in a board question, you may be asked what to do when a patient offers you a large expensive gift, and the answer is usually to decline it. On the other hand, if the gift is very small, these are generally considered okay. Romantic relationships with current patients are never okay. According to the American Medical Association, sexual contact concurrent with the patient-physician relationship is sexual misconduct. So anytime you're faced with a board question about a patient who wants to date you, the answer is to always say, I cannot date you because you are my patient. Now, sometimes one of the answer choices will say to break off the physician-patient relationship, and then you can date the patient. You should be very careful about choosing an answer like this. Many times, if you break off the physician-patient relationship, you will put the patient in danger because they will no longer have a doctor. So usually, in these types of questions about romantic relationships, the answer is always that it's not okay to date the patient. Let's talk about some rules governing the patient-physician relationship. So physicians can decline to care for a patient. For example, I don't have to accept all patients who come to my office seeking care. However, once I start a relationship with a patient, then I cannot refuse treatment. And the way this often comes up in board questions is that a doctor doesn't want to perform an abortion or another procedure that the patient is seeking. You can't just refuse to perform the procedure when you have started a relationship with that patient. You have to help them. This doesn't mean you need to perform the procedure that you don't want to perform, but you must refer them to another provider. This is usually the correct answer. So once the patient is your patient and they want a particular medical procedure, even if you're not comfortable providing it, you still have to refer them to someone else who can help the rules around medical errors are very simple. Mistakes and errors should always be disclosed to patients. There's a large literature base on this showing that if you immediately admit an error, usually patients will forgive you and this will lead to less problems down the road. So if you're faced with a board question where a medication is given an error or there's a mistake during a surgical operation, the answer is always to tell the patient right away what happened. Many times physicians are asked by their family members or friends for medical care. Most medical societies recommend against giving non-emergent medical care to family and friends. There are many ethical conflicts. For example, you might hesitate to take a full social history about drug use with a family member or a friend, and there are many other ethical pitfalls. The one exception is an emergency. Obviously, if one of your family members or friends are very sick, you can help them as a physician. But if it's a non-emergent situation, you should refer them to another doctor. And sometimes when physicians are interviewing patients, their family may be present during the encounter. Sometimes this can be disruptive. For example, the patient's family member may answer for the patient or otherwise disrupt the interview. In these situations, what you want to do is get the patient alone so you can take a history directly from them without being disrupted. The key thing to know here for the USMLA exam is you don't want to ask the patient if they want the family member present or not. The patient may be afraid to say no in front of their family members, so the right answer is usually to politely ask the family member for time alone with the patient so that you can interview them alone without having all the answers provided by the family member and without being otherwise disrupted. A non-compliant patient is a patient who doesn't comply with the recommendations of the physician. For example, it may be a patient who doesn't turn up for their appointments or doesn't take their medicines or doesn't go for tests. And if you're faced with a patient like this, 
in a board question, the answer is usually to try and understand why they are non-compliant. You want to know why they don't want to take their meds or why they don't want to go for tests. You also want to try to help. You can provide more information if that's one of the answer choices. But the key thing here is to avoid scolding or threats. You don't want to say things like, you will get sick if you don't do what I say. Remember what I told you at the beginning of this video? You need to respect patients' autonomy even when they make decisions you may not agree with. So the correct answer in the setting of a non-compliant patient is usually to try to help them and try to understand why they're not complying with your recommendations. And the same general rules apply to emotional patients. So sometimes you're faced with a description of a patient who is very tearful and upset and agitated. What you want to do in this situation is acknowledge the patient's feelings, say things like, I understand you are upset. You always want to try to understand why they are so upset, what's bothering them, do they understand all the issues. Once again, though, you want to avoid telling patients to calm down. You don't want to boss people around. You want to respect their autonomy, and you don't want to ignore the emotions because the emotions may represent a serious issue that you need to understand in order to care for the patient. Once again, though, trying to understand why and trying to acknowledge and respect the patient's feelings is usually the best answer. And that concludes our video on ethical principles.